Welcome to another edition of Hometown Histories, the oral history project of the Ocean Township Museum. I'm Dallas Grove. Today we'll hear unique perspectives on the fabled and fabulous Supper Club Hotel and Casino that once existed on the shores of Deal Lake in the Wanamassa section of Ocean Township called Ross Fenton Farm. It's remembered to this day for the world-class celebrities that entertained there and for the fire in 1950 that brought it down. With us today, our own Brenda Wittick, past president of the Ocean Township Museum, will be speaking with Bruce Horn, a member of the Wanamassa Fire Department since 1968. He's also its archivist and historian. His father, Walter Horn, fought the blaze on that memorable night, and Bruce has his own history with the site to add. And Ron Gorski, the president of the original Township Historical Society formed in the 1970s. He's an industrial arts former teacher and a Wanamassa resident familiar with the remains of that day at Ross Fenton Farm. Okay, thanks for joining me today. Um, there's a lot to talk about Ross Benton Farm. Um, the property was owned by R. R. Hulick um, when Ross and Fenton rented the farm. Uh, in 1898, they fell in love. They came to the area, they fell in love with the area after renting it, and they purchased the land. Um, they opened up Ross Benton Farm. It was a thriving nightclub, as you both know, in the area. It was located not in Asbury Park, it was located in Wanamasa in Ocean Township. Um, and it also doubled as their primary residence, as Ron is going to talk about today. Um, the Wanamasa Farm, we'll call it for now, was located um, right on Deal Lake. Um, it, had, it was chosen because it was close to uh, Ocean Grove and Asbury, but it was a summer religious camp and resort. No alcohol could be served. It was within the one mile radius, so they chose Wanamasa instead of uh, Asbury Park, where liquor could be legally uh, sold and served. But it was also one of the most rated gambling establishments along the coast. Wow. How did people get there? <laughs> well, they got there by trains and trolleys, which carried uh, the patrons to the dock in Interlaken, where livery boats ran regularly to the farm. The club was so successful that in, in the season, over 100 trains stopped daily, leaving their guests at the Interlaken gates on Grasmere Avenue. From there, they boarded one of the many uh, livery boats that ran regularly uh, to the uh, farm stock. It was a large working farm with greenhouses, a large lakeside hotel, several guest cottages, and two casinos. It opened up on Memorial Day every year with large palm trees, fresh flowers. Um, they were all in the dining hall and the guests arrived. Lobster cocktail was a dollar twenty-five. Filet mignon two dollars and twenty-five cents. <laughs> sea bass one dollar. Can you imagine? <laughs> the farm was a place also where Ross and Fenton can display all the items that they collected over the years that they entertained their friends. For a number of years, Ross and Fenton Farm was a popular mecca for New York area artists and entertainers such as Lillian Russell, Helen Morgan. Marie Dressler, Sarah Bernhardt, Irish tenor John McCormick, Fanny Bryce, Danny Kay, Jackie Gleason, John Philip Seuss's band, top entertainers and uh, bands of the time. Ross Fenton Farm was also a popular evening attraction for locals while they floated along Deal Lake in their canoes to listen to top music of big bands and orchestras that were playing in the nightclub. There's a story of Helen Morgan, who was, a who was scheduled to appear at Ross Benton Lake one evening after the Broadway play. Local residents came out and lined the lake in their canoes, holding torches so that the seaplane would know where to land. In 1902, while Charles Ross was in Providence, Rhode Island, something happened. And I'm going to refer to you, Bruce. <laughs> That was the first fire they had at Ross Fenton Farms mm -hmm. in 1902. It was long before the Wanamassa Fire Company was ever formed. And um, they, according to the article 
they tried to extinguish themselves and they finally wound up calling Neptune to come in and help them out. Yes. Uh, that was long before. And since then, in 1911, they formed a fire company for Ross Fenton Farms because they I own a fire company, which Ross Fenton Farms was located in the Iona Park section of Ocean Township. They referred to it, and that went from at that mm -hmm. time Fenton Road, which is now South Winnemassa Drive, over to the bridge and Colonial Terrace. And that was the uh, there was another hotel, and the Griffin had a hotel there, Terrace Gardens, and that was a very popular section right there. Uh, Ross and Fenton continued to summer in their cottage until uh, Ross's death in 1918. Mabel continued to operate the business until she passed in 1931, the place where she was born. They never had children. Ross Fenton Farm defied prohibition and flourished despite the depression. Ross Fenton Farm featured good food, good music, outstanding entertainment. It still enjoys a reputation throughout the Jersey Shore that has been unrivaled since it closed. In 1950, most of the resort burned to the ground again. What happened yes. there? Well, on September 5th of 1950, there was a uh, large fire at the uh, Ross Fenton Farms. By that time, it had been closed for three years, several years. And uh, upon arrival by the fire company, they claimed that the um, flames were 200 feet in the air. Most of this information does come from the Asbury Park Press uh, article dated September 6, 1950. So I want to refer to most of this because was, I was only three years old, way before my time to remember. All right. Uh, their fire companies were Oakhurst, uh, Allenhurst, and Wayside Fire Company. Asbury Park had stationed themselves on the north side of Deal Lake, along that section of Deal Lake, because there was a heavy northeasterly wind blowing and they were protecting the homes on the other side of the lake from the uh, flaming embers that were coming over. So Asbury was not involved at that time. It, it took two hours to get it under control and during the time um, there were several explosions in the building. They don't know what they were from, but they could have been stored, any kind of things. And uh, Albert Koenig, who was very prominently known in Ocean Township, he was fire chief at the time. And my father, Walter Horn, he was assistant fire chief at the time. And um, speculation that the gas meter exploded and started the fire, but as time went by, those things became, you know, less relevant than anything else. But the cause of the fire was never known. Mm -hmm. And there was one member uh, injured during that, Rich Kircheron, they referred to him as Dick. His uh, sister was involved in the, the organization here and was treated by the one of the first day, he stepped on the nail. That time was a minor minor incident, but it was reported in, in the newspaper article. I remember reading that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the farm was rebuilt. The farm was never rebuilt, never I'm rebuilt. sorry, uh, but Walter Reed, Junior Enterprises, who owned the property at the time, parceled off most of the property. Um, about 32 single family homes were built where the resort once stood. And the only structures that are left and I'm going to refer to you, Ron. Okay. All right. Well, Walt, Walter Reed did get the property from uh, a Joseph Bryan. And uh, when I did the original uh, title search on the property, uh, I found that he inherited the property from Joseph Bryan. Okay. Uh, when we moved into the house in 1955, there was a carving in the fireplace in the stone uh, that said JB on it. And I always told my parents that must have been Joseph Bryan. Of course, they didn't pay any attention to me. But several years ago when I did the, the title search, it all made sense that it probably was him. Uh, Walter Reed uh, was going to call that Hollywood Estates, and for a while, uh, Fenton Road, South Monomass Drive, was known as Hollywood Road. Um, we, My parents bought the property from uh, family called DeSantis, and uh, when, when they got it, there really wasn't much left as far as uh, the legacy of Ross and Fenton, uh, because there had been four owners, and uh, I believe that when uh, Mabel Fenton died, uh, she sold it, the property to another individual, I, I don't recall that, so there were four owners uh, prior to my parents buying it in 1955. Uh, the house was built in 1905, and uh, we can be pretty much uh, 
short of that date from uh, in the maids' quarters, which is uh, on the second floor, and the second floor consists of just one room. Uh, behind the mirror, which we replaced uh, on a closet door, was an article about the Harry Thaw murder case. And uh, that took place in 1906. So we're pretty sure that between 1905 and 1906, uh, when that mirror was installed, it, it was used to pad it out to keep it from vibrating. So we have a pretty well-preserved uh, article from a, a New York newspaper. Uh, some of the, uh, the wiring is still there, like the, the bell circuits that uh, were used to summon the maid. And in the front room, there's a, a, a buzzer, a button, and that wiring goes all the way up into the maid's quarters. But uh, other than those few accoutrements, uh, there, there's really nothing to say, you know, that Charlie Ross and Mabel Fenton uh, live there. Uh, across the street uh, was 1701. This was uh, supposed to be their uh, their guest cottage. And uh, the construction is the same. The, the building uh, buildings are exactly the same as far as the, the hardware, the foundations, and so on. And uh, in my time, uh, two, uh, two ladies lived there, Louise Cox and uh, Kitty Hayden, and she was uh, the, the Cox uh, family that had signed the Declaration of Independence, and Kitty Hayden, I believe, was uh, of the Hayden Planetarium. So they were living there in the, uh, in the 1930s up until the <clears throat> 1960s, and um, I got to be their chauffeur. Um, they had an old Studebaker president, and my mother was their fourth for bridge. So uh, when I got a driver's license, I would take them to their various uh, luncheons, and uh, and I was also the groundskeeper on the on the property. Uh, so <clears throat> Bruce and I grew up about the same time, so we have recollections of what the community was like mm -hmm. uh, in in the mid '50s and into the early '60s. So Bruce, uh, you remember the Wanamassa stores? You know yes. what was there at the time. The limited uh, grocery shopping that you could do there it was uh, uh, where the florist shop is uh, today. That was the grocery store. It was owned by Dick Kinslow. Yes. Yeah. And uh, next to that, I think, was a bakery. It was one massive bakery. Yeah. And uh, I remember getting going there instead of getting an ice cream cone for a dime, I would get two crumb buns for that same dime. So I remember that fondly. And. Uh, then there was also the one there was a luncheonette there wasn't it yes and uh was that larry's i don't know if that was larry's at the time i do remember where pettits was he had a soda fountain yeah and in a pharmacy also at that time had a large soda fountain and uh yeah it was very interesting yeah i remember i was thinking i made a few notes about pettits uh, pettits was an all-purpose store he had magazines he had uh cigarettes and uh he made it. He made his own ice cream, matter of fact. And when you bought stuff, it was like uh, the triple S green stamps. He issued this script called Wampum. Yes. And I never knew anybody that got anything with it or what you could do with it, but we used to <laughs> save it. And it said Fred Pettit, President, on it. And uh, we'd hang out there. He had a pinball machine, mm -hmm. and he, is, he and his wife. Uh, um, you know, would man that. On Sundays, uh, Harry Guyberson's grandmother would take over uh, for, I guess, Sunday was their only day off. So, uh, yeah, and of course the pharmacy was there and uh, <clears throat> various stores at the end. Uh, I remember it as Cumberland Farms. It was sort of kind of like the forerunner to uh, a 7-Eleven. And the five and dime was in between. And, yeah, and that the five and dime. Yeah. And what year is this? Wow. <laughs> I can remember on a, on a hot day, he would hang a block of ice in front of the heater and the fan would blow across to cool the room. <laughs> yep. Old days. Very nice. But they're, uh, yeah, and uh, one of the buildings in here, in the, in the background, in a, way back through the wooded area, this house, which is still located there on the uh, northeast corner, mm -hmm. 
behind the house was a gambling hall. And we, I, to this day, I can't remember how, but we gained access to this. We just by, kicked the door in. <laughs> we, the, the person who lived in the house, we were friends with, and there was an adjacent door, behind, it was like a closet, and behind the closet was this door. We wanted to know what was behind the door. Well, the door led into the gambling hall. And when I can remember walking in, it's just like somebody had got up, walked out the door, locked the door behind them, and never came back. The tables, there was uh, a stage, a full-size stage. Uh, there were roulette wheels. There were blackjack tables, and they were just, just there, uncovered. And I can remember it was green. Ron, I think remembers it as red. I remember. But maybe we'll colorblind at the time. <laughs> but. Um, we had gone in and looked around, and for some reason, the police department got word that they were, we were in there. They never did anything. They just came and took everything and shipped it all out, from what I understand, to Las Vegas. But the gambling hall had stayed there until the 60s. Yeah. It, uh, it was amazing from all that time. Mm. They tore it down. They put two houses on it. Two houses on it. But uh, it was just like they just got up and walked out of the building, never came mm. back. No, I was I was just thinking about the, as I said, there wasn't much in our house uh, that you know showed any indication they were there, but um, further down by the lake, there were some remnants uh, of the fact that the the hotel had been there. Mm -hmm. One of the things that survived the fire and the uh, the demolition was what was probably a dance floor. It was like a a marble or cast surface. Uh, that we used to roller skate on. And uh, I don't know if it's still there today because once they built the houses down there, you know, we never mm -hmm. went on the property. Mm -hmm. But uh, before the houses were constructed, we would go down and, and skate and then we would fish off of the pier or, or the dock. And it was a masonry dock. Uh, and you can see in the water all the balusters that had okay. made up, you know, the, the protective railing. They were all cast uh, masonry balusters. And they'd be all around in the water. And I know that when we'd fish, our lures would get snagged on some of the debris. And I'm sure I lost at least two hula poppers <laughs> in that. Uh, and it, it like a buck a piece, which was real money back then. And that was kind of upsetting. But uh, uh, as we walked along the sides, but there really wasn't any signs of construction or uh, debris, and this is only maybe five, six years after it, it had uh, been burned. Mm -hmm. So they did a good job of cleaning up the site, but it wasn't until, I guess, the late 50s that they started to construct houses there. And uh, the first houses they built on South Wanamassa, just as it turns into Hedgewood, they went too deep and they wound up with a water problem. And uh, the foundation filled up with water. Uh, and they abandoned it, and we wound up uh, stocking it with fish and frogs and turtles. <laughs> and the, the neighbors hated us because the frogs would sit there at night just croaking. So uh, eventually they drained it and they, they finished the project. So. Well, Ron, your story about the balusters and, um, and then that location, that is actually where the stairs led down to Dale Lake, and that survived. Oh. So, and I, it's still there today. Yeah. So, I went about a year and a half ago and I took photographs of it. But in 2011, Hurricane Irene came through huh. and uh, a very large tree from a neighbor fell onto the stairwell and this, oh. this large wall yeah. and it cracked the wall. So, the family that lives there today had a construction team come in to fix the wall. Um, but they found when they went under the deck, which the part of the deck was cracked, yeah. um, they had to go into the water and they found a, a baluster, which the family donated to the museum. So we have one here today okay. <laughs> of what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, and yeah. it was donated by the family who lives there today. So yeah. that decking is still there yeah. and they're trying to preserve it. So that's kind of thing. It has survived. As a kid, you saw all of them, and you know, I never thought, like, gee, it'd be nice to have one of those or put <laughs> it on my front lawn or whatever. They were just well, I can say there were there was only one, and you said there were many. Oh, so. there, were, there were lots of them. Yes, yeah. 
It's very cool. And we have it. We have it here at the museum today. It's a lot of history in Deal Lake to have lost. So. Yes. And so entertainment still goes on at Ross Fenton Farm because the family that lives there still uses that dock or deck, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. The family had uh, their son's engagement party there right on that, that dock. And they also um, had a friend's wedding there. Mm -hmm. So parties still go on at the <laughs> Ross Fenton Farm, <laughs> which is nice. You know, I also remember what it was like uh, on Highway 35 and the stores that were there, the Cypress Inn. Uh, I remember what a sleepy road Highway 35 was when I, when I was a kid. Um, it seemed like during the summer, you could almost lay down on the road and a car wouldn't come by for a period of time. And the other thing that, that stands out was the oil slicks that would be down the middle of the road because cars back then did not have pollution control. They just had a crankcase ventilator on all the older cars and all the smog blew straight down. So that if you looked up and down the road, you saw these oil slicks on either side. But when you crossed Highway 35 to where Wegmans is in the industrial park today, there was nothing. You walked up and there was an apple orchard that wound up through an area that we all called Sand Hills. And uh, from there, you could just have an adventure. You could go to the pig farm. You could go to the shooting range. You could go to the, the spring. There was an artesian well. And uh, I don't know if you were ever up there, if you remember any of that. I remember it well. <laughs> I remember it very well. And we would walk down the street on Sunset Avenue carrying our rifles and uh, just go up to the shooting range. and. You know, nobody bothered us. We used to hunt that whole area. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's it's changed. And uh, but uh, you know, we were lucky that at the time there was a place where kids could go, and you know, we didn't didn't have our little personal electronic devices. Kids went out on the street and had adventures. That's true. And, you know, they they did things. So uh, that was uh, one of the opportunities. And of course, we all fished. Uh, in the springtime, the herring would come in to Deal Lake, they would come up into uh, on North Bonamassa on the North Branch. And we'd go there and we'd start catching the herring with our nets. And uh, you caught crabs in the bridge between Bonamassa and Colonial Terrace by the golf course. You could yeah, walk underneath yeah. the bridge with a net and scoop the crabs out from underneath the bridge. And you know, when, the when, when we were doing that, when we were, they were blue claw crabs, which is a saltwater crab. And we didn't understand at the time that there was a pretty good reason why there were saltwater crabs there, because at the turn of the last century, Deal Lake was open to the ocean. That's right. And it wasn't until uh, James Bradley closed it off because it was, you know, I guess, when the tide was out, it created a smell. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, it was a brackish body of water, and those crabs made the transition. So we uh, would go down, and we called that area by Colonial Terrace. We called it Eel Falls because we actually saw the eels going up the flume into the golf course side of the lake, and then there were sunfish that would accumulate there. And so, you know, Bruce and I had a lot of the same adventures, if not together, at, at different times. And that's what kids did then. We hung out uh, down at the lake. Uh, it was, you know, a lot of wildlife and learned about nature. We did mm -hmm. snakes and <laughs> so. It's a lot there. Yeah. Really interesting. When we were talking about Rose Fenton, I just came to my mind. Uh, I was doing uh, talking to one of our senior members who had since passed away, and it was very prominent in Ocean Township. But he told me, as a child, not as a child, but a young adult, he can remember. He remembers meeting the boats out in the ocean and floating the liquor up to Ross Fenton Farms. They would swim. They would load her onto a raft and swim it all the way up to Ross Fenton Farms. Oh my God. <laughs> and the boats just off the shoreline, loaded the liquor up and floated it in. <laughs> but I won't mention his name. So uh, Was that during Prohibition or? During Prohibition. Okay. There was a lot during Prohibition yes. uh, oh. that, had, that went on. And deal like, you know, like Ron said, was open to the ocean. And there are many articles in the press that I found that relate to that because they used to have big boat parades illuminated boats back in the early 20s with lights on them and they had the uh, 
the queen, the sea queen of Asbury Park, who lived in Philadelphia. But there's many articles about these things from Asbury Park that filtered into Ocean Township at the mm -hmm. time. I found a few things in the walls of, of the house. And what happened is I was working on the, the bathroom. Um, I was blowing insulation on an interior wall, thinking, well, I'm going to make this nice and snug. And when I put a hole in there, uh, there was paper inside it. So I pulled some of the paper out, and it turns out there were three items. They weren't planted in the walls, it turns out, which is you know much more mysterious. What happened is the attic is above it, and it simply dropped down through the, uh, the, the wall cavity. So one of them was an insurance policy for an, an Andrew uh, Albright. He was the president of Rubber Set Brush Company. And I believe he was the owner. And I didn't, I didn't verify that, so I can't say for a fact. But it says his policy was for uh, uh, securement of a loan. And uh, I think he was the operator when uh, Mabel uh, Fenton stopped operating. And I believe that this is the individual that handled it. So I have that. I have all his information. There's a love letter that was in there to uh, Mrs. Albright. Uh, which is the, the same name as the insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there was just uh, this advertisement for, uh, for a restaurant and a hotel that was there. That's all we ever, ever found in it. But, uh, you know, people... Well, I do remember reading something about the Albright family, and I'll get back okay, to you on right. that. Okay, all right. Well, then you I have something in my notes. Me. I just... Wouldn't be able to put my finger on it yeah, right now, well, but perhaps later. More to come. Yeah, so this may tie into yes. it and solve some mysteries. Mm -hmm. But it was he had uh, two policies for a hundred thousand dollars, which in 1926 was real money. That's right. So mm -hmm. well, and uh, you know it's got his medical bio in it and so on. But left it behind, and then. Uh, Apparently, they, this was here in 1930 because he uh, then sets the beneficiary as his wife. So uh, the latest that they, he was there would be, or at least last time, latest this could be was 1930. But, uh, okay. This was left behind. Okay. A quick question. So uh, Ross Fenton Farm, the buildings that are left, mm -hmm. is the home that... Ross and Fenton lived in. Right, that they is, refer to as their cottage, their cottage, which is our house. Right, yeah. which is your home. Mm -hmm. Across the street, which is the gambling house. Well, on the corner of uh, Unami and South Hanamasa mm -hmm. Drive, uh, on the opposite corner, that was the front of what was the, the gambling casino. Okay. And that's a, a private residence today. Okay. Uh, at 1701, which is diagonal to, to my house is, is this okay. house. And um, I own that today. I, okay. I acquired it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've done some work on it to stabilize it, um, trying to get a mason to, uh, to do the exterior, exterior work okay. on it. Uh, but that's all that I, I'm sure about. And uh, there's supposedly a house on Wardell Place that was the oh. caretakers, yes. which is. Mm -hmm. uh, just at the end of Ward, Wardell Place as it turns. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a house uh, between um, Laurel, uh, well, it's on the corner of Laurel and South Guanamassa Drive that looks like the same construction, and the owners say that they think it's part of the Ross Fenton Farms. Uh, but of the 32 buildings that were originally there, uh, these are the only ones that they're either suspected or that we're sure okay. were part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. So. When um, Walter Reed built those houses on Bryan Avenue, anything that was there was just taken down. Mm -hmm. so. There is a 1910 water company map, and it shows the structures on Ross Fenton. It's a large block of, and they outline where the structures were. Oh, wow. When they installed the water meters, I believe, I know Rutgers has it on file in their library. I do have a copy of it at home. I, I should have brought it with me, but it shows the structures on Ross Fenton. It's just, you know, somebody just drew them in, but uh, it's an old water company. Okay. Map. Yeah, we'd love to see that. Yeah, and the, the only other thing that we ever discovered on the property is uh, 
I guess it would be not a cistern, uh, maybe a septic tank. And um, I was digging in the, in the back uh, about uh, 15 years ago when I came across some bricks, a pit, an oval pit about eight feet uh, on the major diameter and about six feet on the minor diameter. And um, it was probably, as I said, a septic tank and it had pipes that not only ran from the direction of the home, but also ran uh, heading west in that direction coming down Bryan Avenue. So uh, that probably was, uh, there probably was a stable nearby because I know it was typical for them to drain stables from, from the horses, uh, you know, into a facility like mm -hmm. that. So that's the only other structure that I know. Well, uh, that would make sense. I know that um, Charles Ross loved to ride horses and really enjoyed that. Yeah. The, uh, the foundations of both this house and uh, our cottage is poured concrete which for 1905-1906 was a, uh, a rare construction for residential construction. And, um, and when I was tracing the title of, of this house, the one across the street, um, a builder named Pittenger appears to be the, the owner of the tract at the time, and he probably built both houses because of, of the similar construction. So the, uh, the interior has uh, uh, terracotta tiles. Uh, they're uh, six by six terracotta tiles. They're one inch thick and they're laid on four inches of concrete and that is over a basement. So, uh, you know, I can only imagine what, what that must weigh. Uh, the paneling is chestnut and you can see where the house was expanded. The, uh, when they originally built it, uh, I saw the postcard at the beginning of the presentation. That's what the house looked like. But my guess is about 1920 to 1932, uh, the house was expanded, uh, moving to the west, and they added uh, the area that I showed you when you, you visited. Uh, it extended the front room by about 12 feet, and it added a bedroom, uh, again, about, uh, well, actually 17 feet, I know the exact that measurement. So when Ross and Fent lived there and they called it a cottage, it was a cottage. It was a relatively small house uh, with a room for a maid. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, maybe they couldn't give up their creature comfort even if uh, they just spent the summers there and, and the rest of the season up in the city. I also have a story about the 1902 fire that you may know of when the fire broke out and the alarm rang and Asbury Park fire department came to uh, the Ross Benton farm. Um, what happened was there was a fire in the kitchen that broke out and the manager was not capable of putting the fire out. He really didn't know what to do and a long time uh, uh, was between the time that the fire broke out and that he called the fire department. It was 20 minutes before the fire department came to, got to Ross Benton Farm another 20 minutes before they were able to set up on Deal Lake to, 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 pump, pump. The, to pump the fire. Yeah. Well, a long time had, yeah. had lapsed. The middle of the building had collapsed at that point. But the manager yelled, let's save the wine and the champagne <laughs> and the liquor in the basement. And so a, a men ran into the basement to save the wine, the champagne, and the liquor, and they brought it out and they secured it over by a tree while they tried to save the rest of the building. Mm -hmm. um, but it really didn't happen. Uh, the building burned. Um, so they decided to drink the champagne, the liquor, and the, the rest of the men who left in the middle of the night left with a couple bottles of, of liquor <laughs> as a thank you. And from what I understand, uh, I believe that the fire truck ended up in Deal Lake. I have to check on that. Yes. Back at that time, Asbury Park had a large volunteer organization. They really weren't formed as they are today. Mm -hmm. They had many uh, stations throughout Asbury Park. And uh, one of them was Enterprise. I'm trying to remember if that was over by the old inspection station on 3rd Avenue. Well, there was, I know there was the Summerfield Firehouse. Yeah, Summerfield. But there was Enterprise. It was over by the uh, old inspection station, which is still there. I believe it's 3rd Avenue. And, uh, they responded to. Okay. And you know what else I have to say? This might be out of sequence, but uh, 
As popular as Ross Fenton, the farm was, as many people that, uh, that attended it, and you know, they probably had people, uh, a photographer going around taking table pictures, like you always see in these old movies about New York nightclubs, that there aren't that many pictures out there. That's true. You know, mm -hmm. why, in, in somebody's attic, someplace, there's got to be a cachet yes. of, you know, pictures taken inside mm -hmm. there, people visiting, or here I am in front of, just like people take selfies today. You know, there had to be people take pictures, uh, and yet occasionally you see a postcard, um, something from a magazine might show up, maybe from the, the Asbury Park Press or maybe possibly the Home News, if, that existed, but there are not a lot of individual photographs that seem to turn mm -hmm. up. And, and maybe I'm wrong because I haven't uh, done that much yeah. research. I my, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, during my research, I did kind of one of Mabel Fenton's relatives contacted me through an email because I had done some stuff. I had posted their uh, burial spot, their plot online, it's over in West Long Branch. Yeah, yeah. And she had contacted me, and there is a video of Mabel Fenton introducing the mayor of Asbury Park. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's an old film, I guess, but they have it on a CD. I, I've, not, I've never seen it, so wow. one of these days, and it's online, you can buy it. She has several videos online. So uh, it's interesting. One of these days, I'll get around to buying that CD. Sure. I don't know if the Historical Society yeah. has purchased it yet. We but have not. You have not. It does show Mabel Fenton introducing the mayor of Asbury Park in one of those buildings. So, uh, but that's far from where my research lies. So. <laughs> there is a little bit around. Yes, but history is lost. There's a lot of history. Like we could talk about Warner Massa for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of information about Warner Massa. For another day. For another yeah. day. Well, yeah. I think we've touched on a lot of Warner Massa. Yeah. That's all right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you for coming today. Oh, I appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Although there have been two exhibits at the museum on aspects of the Ross Fenton Farm, interest never seems to fade. We'll keep you updated as new research comes to light. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more Hometown Histories.